Okay, good afternoon. Hopefully you've all had a chance to have some lunch and stretch your legs. Um, and welcome back to um, the next careers panel, which is Technology on Mars. Um, so my name is Susan Buckle. I am the Space Careers Lead at the UK Space Agency. And I'm delighted you're all here. Um, hopefully you've caught some sessions from this morning um, and, and found it really interesting and um, have a great, obviously you're here because you have an interest in space. Uh, in particular in Mars and maybe looking now to um, what kind of careers are possible in this sector and if so you're about 10 steps ahead of me um, if you're uh, still at school because I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do then um, so hopefully today is giving you some inspiration of different pathways that you can take. Um, I'm here with three panel members who I will introduce into a moment in a moment um, or let them introduce themselves and explain how they're um, careers have taken them off into, well not quite into Mars, but in, in the direction of Mars. Um, but before I do that, I just thought I would quickly tell you my story about how I came to work in the space sector. For those of you that have been talking, and I know in the last session as well, the question came up about kind of different routes into the sector. You know, do you have to be a scientist, an engineer? Do you have to have A-star grades um, and study at, at university? Um, my answer to that is definitely yes, if that's the area you want to go into. And our panellists have all kind of come through that route and can talk more about that. Mine was slightly different. I actually studied psychology at university, but I was always interested in aviation. And I got my pilot's licence when I was 17, which really um, just fueled my passion for the aerospace sector. And uh, yeah, but I was always interested in psychology and didn't dream that I'd end up in the space um, world, um, but I did. I um, uh, went and studied uh, human factors in aeronautics um, for my master's. And whilst I was there, saw a job advertised for the European Space Agency, teaching astronauts and the mission control crew, uh, human behavior and performance, all the psychological teamwork aspects that are required for a human spaceflight mission. And never ever thought I'd get the job, but I did and ended up um, over in the astronaut, uh, European Astronaut Centre in Cologne for five years before coming back to the UK and working for the UK Space Agency, um, helping um, them with their education and skills and getting youngsters interested in studying science, technology, engineering and maths and looking at careers in the space sector, which is why I'm here today. And um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you um, to my three panel members who can talk more specifically about careers um, in the space sector um, related to Mars, because it's Mars Day. So I can see on my screen, first of all, is Sara. So um, if you'd like to unmute yourself and um, introduce what it is that you do, um, <clears throat> that would be great. Yeah, no worries. So my name is Sarah Matagan and I'm a space and planetary science PhD student um, researcher between the Natural History Museum in London and Imperial College. So um, just a little bit of my background. So I did the kind of like typical range of space industry. I studied astrophysics at university and then went on to move into a planetary science based PhD programme. Um, the work that I do just now, um, what my PhD is focusing on is testing some of the instruments that are destined for Mars. So all of the instruments I work on are spectral instruments. They look at the way light interacts with matter to help us understand the different materials that we're looking at. That happens on Earth, that's done from orbit, um, on Mars and elsewhere in the solar system. And I develop techniques, tools, and some software to help us maximize the science that we do on mission in the kind of short time scales that we have for them. Great, thank you, Sarah. And next up, Matt. Hi, uh, I'm Matt Baum. Um, I'm a professor at Open University. Um, I'm a planetary geologist. I specialize in, in Mars. I spent an awful lot of my time looking down at the surface of Mars um, using orbital spacecraft, looking at pictures. Um, but for the last five or six years, I've been really heavily involved in the PANCAM instrument. That's the, the main eyes of the Rosalind Franklin ExoMars rover mission. Um, so that's what I do. Um, I come from a sort of a, a physics background originally, but I took a massive detour um, during my undergraduate. At the end of that, I decided that I wanted to do geology. And so I moved to the geology department to do a PhD um, about 25 years ago, bizarrely. So it's, it's not as cool as your story about training astronauts how to think, though, which I think is really cool. <laughs> so. it, it was very cool. Um... <laughs> 
but I, I like detours as well. They're always the most interesting. <laughs> Some people are very like set and they know what they want to do and that's fantastic. And I'm very envious, but I also <laughs> think it's quite fun to kind of follow your interests and, and take those detours because look where, or look where you've ended up now. It's really, really interesting. Thank you. And then last but not least, we've got Manish. Yeah, hi everyone, I'm Manish. I'm also at Yoga University in uh, Melbourne Keynes. I, I kind of did a bit of both, I guess. Uh, I, I always knew I wanted to, to do stuff relating to space. You know, I, I loved astronomy as a kid. Uh, my dad had a telescope, all that kind of stuff. But I took a bit of a random walk in terms of what I was going to do. And I would certainly say I hadn't planned to end up where I am now. But as Susan says, you kind of need to let the path take you where it needs to go sometimes, I think. And, and, th and science and academia is exactly that you kind of, uh, you end up where you should be uh, most of the time, uh, as long as you follow what you really want to do. Um, I, I build spacecraft instruments, so uh, bits, of, bits of kit to go on Mars landers, Mars orbiters to, to investigate these environments and stuff. And, uh, you know, in, in lieu of being a Mars astronaut, next best thing is to send something that you make and uh, I like making things I like taking them apart and that tends to work in this kind of field and then seeing the results and trying to interpret this stuff that no one's no one's ever seen before that's fun yeah definitely <laughs> um, I should have said also um to the audience please pop some um questions in the q and I'll kick off whilst I'm trying to read the questions um but yeah we've heard that some of you obviously were interested um in space from a young age um, but Sarah, I can't remember, what, what did you say? Were you, was it something you were always interested in? Yeah, so my kind of like switch into more planetary focused science um, came a bit later, but I've kind of always been obsessed with space. Um, I don't recommend this, but I used to climb out on the roof of my parents' house to like watch the stars because we lived in like the middle of nowhere and it was really dark. Um, and I've just always really like loved space and looking up and kind of like thinking about where we fit into this like giant cosmic puzzle um and then when I went to uni I was kind of like I'm gonna do stellar astronomy that's like that's gonna be my thing and then I was like well I can't go to the sun so kind of like Manish I want to be an astronaut like one day hopefully like down the line and studying a planet a planet that it's quite likely we will one day visit seems like a much better way of pushing my dreams towards um boots on Mars yeah definitely so when you were back at if we kind of because I'm just thinking about that I know we've got nearly 300 um, people listening to us right now and they're going to be from all different backgrounds and ages and everything but I'm thinking we're going to have quite a lot of school students here so what subjects did you study say it so again this is well you know people uh, got participants from across the world not just in the UK but what subjects did you study kind of at the age of 16 18 um, yeah no worries. So um, I'm from Scotland, so I did the Scottish, um, the Scottish system, which is actually different to the way it is now. So I did standard age um, and then into higher as an advanced higher. So the higher year where you kind of like select down, you pick about five subjects. I did physics, math, English, modern studies and biology. Um, it was kind of controversial that I didn't want to take chemistry, but I just really liked biology. I thought it was really cool. And it, it kind of um, lends itself well to that like space medicine and astronaut kind of um, stuff which was really really cool um, and I like that kind of interplay between the two and then when I looked um, at my kind of final year um, subjects so that's being a dance stars in Scotland I did physics math and art because I love physics math and art <laughs> Yeah, but that's it. Like I was talking to the um, panel members before this one and we were saying a similar thing, like there's so many different routes into it. And I genuinely feel my personal opinion, but I'd love to know everyone else's is, you know, follow your passion as well. Like, great. If you want to work in the space sector, definitely. We always encourage studying, you know, science, technology, engineering, maths um, subjects. But if there's other subjects like art and, you know, English literature, whatever it might be, you know, you never know how that might help you and kind of lead you to where you are now, for example. So, Thank you, Sarah. What about you, Matt? What did you study at, at school and, and did it help <laughs> in your career? Well, I think you know, it's very traditional for people who end up doing a physics degree. You know, I did maths, physics, chemistry, further maths at A-level, and I did all the sciences I, I could, really. Um, you know, I, That's what I was into and what I enjoyed. So um, I think my, my feeling was that if I did the things I was good at and also the things I enjoyed. Um, so when I did my, I can remember choosing GCSEs and thinking, well, I have to do one humanity, you know, and thinking, well, I'm not really into humanities, but I chose economics. And actually I really, really enjoyed doing economics. Um, 
because that was my school was pretty inflexible. So um, like I think I would have liked to have done what Sarah did. So um, I wanted to do English literature at A level as well, but that didn't fit with the you know the things that we wanted to do. So my school, I think nowadays things can be a lot more flexible. Um, but you know it hasn't stopped me reading <laughs> and yeah. having strong opinions on books. So uh, you know it, it's become a you know a lifelong hobby rather than a, a thing I did. I mean. Um, for me, I, I also I left school at 18 and I didn't go to university. I, I went and got a job. So I had various commitments that I felt I had to meet. And so I got a job. And it was only after a year that um, I realized that perhaps university would have been a better choice for me. <laughs> so, um, you know, it could have all have turned out very, very differently in my life if I'd have stayed working in the uh, pesticides development factory that I, that I had a job in for a year. I, I, it taught me a lot of great stuff that job you know um very hands-on and analytical but um yeah would have been a very different life I think but then um, did you go back to university at a later age or, or I just, it was essentially equivalent of taking a year out right so you know I, I I went to you know I had this job for just over a year and actually because I I did that job I worked back there every Easter and summer through my university so that actually paid my way through university yeah. so you know sometimes you think you know not going to university straight away maybe may hamper you but actually it doesn't no. you know it, it, you've got there's a lot of a lot of time in the rest of your life even though it seems like when you're 16 to 18 that's uh, there isn't a lot of time so. I think that's just as important to kind of figure out the things you don't want to do as well as the things you do want to do. And obviously you and um, Manish work at the OU where there's going to be a lot of more mature students that are going back and, and restudying again at a later age. So, yeah, Or people who never had the opportunity yeah. for various reasons. And yeah. no matter what age you are, as, a, as the Open University is particularly one example, but it can offer you a chance to do a, a qualification or a degree mm. that you might not have had the chance to do before. Yeah. So. Great, thank you. And then Manish, kind of following on from that, but we've had a question from Mr. Thomas, who is watching with his class of year five pupils, and he's asked what top what top tips would you have for any of um, his pupils interested in a career in STEM subjects? So they studied space, oh, was their topic earlier in the year, but Manish, do you have any other top tips um, for top those tips. interested in a career in, in STEM? <laughs> I, I wish I had such top tips to give because I don't follow them myself. But um, uh, all I can say is, I mean, you kind of covered it before. Passion and excellence, yeah, they are they are coupled like that. And if you if you want to pursue a, a career in academia or research or industry or anything space related, it requires excellence. You've got to be, you know, really good at what you do. And you, to do that, you need to know what you want to do because you you have to jump in completely immerse yourself in it so doing what motivates you what compels you finding that out is the key thing so whatever subjects you like doing do them and uh you know i, I like like sarah i didn't have well, unlike sarah i didn't have that choice to do a, a wider range of things i just did maths physics chemistry and carried on on that route i then retrained later in life actually at the ou i've studied uh, geology i've studied business as part of you know in, as an aside to my job, because I find these things interesting. So finding what motivates you and what compels you and finding those things that you don't want to do, I think, as you said, that's the, that's the most important thing. So focusing on what you really love, uh, it's the hardest thing to figure out sometimes, but it's the most important. Yeah, and I think also like your people, you know, your career lasts for years and years, doesn't it? So there's always there's not too late to change for the audience that you know might be a bit older than school age and kind of thinking, oh, I think I've missed out here. <laughs> I want to get into this. Can I just add that you know one of the things that I discovered from working at the OU and meeting people is that um, you may not know what you're excellent at, but if you follow your passion, then you 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 do get to know what you're excellent at. And so I think sometimes people feel oh, well, I'm, I'm not the best in, in the class or I'm not the best in my university level or whatever. You know, maybe I'm not excellent, but maybe you just don't know what you're excellent at yet. So I think it's really important to follow what, you're, what you enjoy as well as what you're good at, you know, 50-50. So. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. And Sarah, do yeah. you, you, yeah. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say there's like kind of some good ways to like figure out like what you're good at. Like 
yeah, you can, depending what metric you're measuring yourself by, like you might seem, you might think that you're not very good at something, but unless you actually get, get the space to try different things, you're never going to know. If you want to like look into different like scientific subjects, so this is, I actually, I really wish I had time. So I went straight to school, to university, straight from university to my PhD. And I kind of wish I'd maybe taken some time in between and I maybe would have like changed my alignment a little bit going into university. Um, like I like stars and that's why I pursued astrophysics and I love my degree. It was really, really enjoyable. I wish I kind of understood what my university offered in terms of planetary courses a little bit better. So like looking in, if you're looking to study, make sure you kind of look at the breadth of different subjects that you're going to get when you're going to university. And just general topics, there's thousands of like pop science articles about all of the new developments and all the work that's going on in like the space industry, the tech industry, or generally science. Um, there's loads of stuff like that that you can have a look into to see like what things kind of pique your fancy and then give it a go. And if you don't like it, that's fine. Like see, see what else there is and try something else. Because I think I used to suffer from this, especially when I was in high school, that like you had this one path and you had to make the right decision at 16 or like you ruined the whole thing. And it's just not true. Like there's space to kind of change around and, and move to see, move to what moves you. Yeah, definitely. And I think I'd add to that and it's kind of leading on to a question with like, you know, doing things outside of just your studies, you know, whether that's at school or degree or whatever it might be. Um, so, for example, I when I was 12, I joined the Air Cadets and that's what got me into my passion for flying and, you know, eventually, you know, getting my license and working in the industry. Um, but, you know, the Air Cadets is free. So I know getting a pilot's license is quite an expensive hobby. There's lots of things you can do outside of school or university. Um, so, yeah, I guess, uh, you know, back over to you, uh, Matt. Did, what did you do, if anything, outside of kind of the normal study routes that might have helped um, ultimately end up in this career? I think from the age of about 12 to about 15, it was war games and role playing games. That's all, that's all I, you know, half my exercise books, I, I, I threw a load out recently and they've all got army lists and things written in the back of them when I should have been studying. Um, I think I got a bit older and I, and then I was just really into music, music, literature and arguing about politics with my friends. Um, played a lot of hockey, but um, yeah, I'm, I was very much um, a social animal, I think, from sort of 16 to 20. You know, I, I just really enjoyed the company of other people. I, you know, my, my hobby was being around my friends and enjoying their company. But at the same time, I was kind of a, enough of a, a hard worker that I wasn't, you know, I always managed to keep my, you know, my studies sort of, you know, as a priority. But, I, I you know, all sorts of different things. But um, just make sure you're enjoying yourself as well as studying really hard, I think is good advice. So well, that's actually quite interesting because I'm going to ask you this question. I'll, I'll come back to the, the other panelists because um, five are at, I assume this might be the school PWPA, um, want to know if the panelists work on their own or with other people, because you mentioned kind of uh, the social aspects of things and people might quite often think of a, a scientist or an engineer kind of working in a lab or, or a clean room or whatever, you know, by themselves and, um, or, or, or is it more of a team, teamwork uh, activity? Yeah, is that, yeah. Okay, <laughs> just because so, you said about being sociable. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> Well, it's funny because um, I think through most of my sort of early career, um, you're working on one little project. It's you. You're 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 very focused on you. Maybe your supervisor or boss. And then I think as I've got you know further into my career, I've actually spent much less time doing science and much more time trying to help other people do science. So I spend a lot of time supervising my research students, looking after the postdocs who work in my group talking to other people around the world, um, you know, lots of meetings um, online, and it used to be in person with people from the European Space Agency. Um, so yeah, I think actually having that sort of early sort of sociable aspect to my life and not just being too laser focused, mm. sort of meant that, you know, I could pick up that social side. You know, it's not so much managing people, it's just trying to you know get the best out of people and be, you know, create a nice working environment when everyone gets the best out of each other. I think that's, yeah. you know, it, I don't think science is or technology is as sort of authoritarian as I think it used to be 20 or 30 years ago. I think it used to be quite hierarchical. And I think people now work, people recognize that people work better in groups with lots of different people who are working together. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I'm very biased in this, obviously, because that's what I was teaching over um, at the space, the European Space Agency. It was all those interpersonal skills. So they realised how important it was, you know, for a high performance team such as the astronauts and the mission control teams to work together, lead each other and have all those interpersonal skills. So I'm glad you confirmed that for me. Manish wants to say something. Yeah, no, Susan, just based on what you said is so true. I say to all my postdoc students, you know, Building this instrument is easy. Doing the science is easy. Getting the stuff to Mars is easy. Working with these massive groups of people and people across uh, different uh, boundaries, different cultures, different countries, different languages, that's the hard part. And you've got personalities thrown in there on top of everything else. And getting that stuff to work, when we live in a global world now in terms of exploration, technology and research, that's the hard bit, really. Um, As Matt says, you know, we don't work in isolation. You can do a lot of science in isolation at your desk if you want, but you can also do a lot of science in groups across the world. I mean, I I went straight into the deep end with the space mission stuff because my PhD was working on that immediately. So straight away, you're you're working with groups across the world and uh, big, big teams of people. And you learn pretty rapidly how to communicate what you're trying to say very quickly, succinctly and clearly because the number of times uh misunderstandings result just from the use of the wrong word it's, mm-hmm. it's fascinating I, I love that psych- that's the psychology of it all is fascinating but you, you have an option either way you can you can have an independence or you can have a full team experience in science it offers yeah. both yeah no I completely agree and yeah especially as again you know Issa but even with my job now you know we're working with not just Europeans but with NASA we did a lot of work with the Chinese space agency as well so it wasn't just the language you know uh, challenges but also you know diff- completely different culture as well so yeah totally agree and I'm going to stick with you Manish for the next question because this is interesting from Lucy Stot- Stottard she um so their children are home educated children so not the traditional routes, but they can spend more time on their passions and aren't restricted to only learning certain things in certain years. And William, aged eight, is very passionate about astronomy. And Manish, I know you um, were, that was kind of your outward interest from, from a young age, wasn't it? Yeah, my, my, my dad had a, my dad's love, he's a pharmacist, so of course he has a telescope in the back garden and I, I, I spent many an evening out just staring at the stars through it. And it it inspires you. It's wonderful and it's wondrous, and uh, it leads it leads you to follow what you what what you, what you love and what inspires you. So, uh, having that flexibility of learning, allowing your learning to to be guided by what you like, I think that's a really that's, that's a really nice uh, gift to have if you like. So, yeah, definitely soak that up and and, and figure out what you like and follow it. I think absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Well, there's another interesting question from Lucy as well, but I'm going to go to Sarah for this one, because Benjamin, aged eight, would like to know if you weren't in the role you are in now, what would you like to be doing and why? <laughs> uh, that's a very good question. Um, I think the kind of like main dichotomy I came to, like growing up about what I wanted to do. So like I've danced my whole life. Um, I've like competed like in the British teams um, and internationally and stuff like that. I love to dance. And my kind of thinking when I was younger was like, either I am like a prima ballerina or I'm going to be an astrophysicist. And I was like, it's going to have to be one or the other because it can't be both. So I would like to say what I would be doing is I would be in a ballet company. I don't know necessarily if I have really the talent for that, but um, I think I would like to be a dancer. I like, I love fashion. I love art. I think something of like that kind of creative space, um, I think when science kind of won out for me, it was because it had more of the things that I wanted. And um, I've been able to mostly, except the kind of pandemic, I guess, keep up dancing alongside all my research and things now. Oh, fantastic. Uh, I think an answer. Yeah. That's, what, that's what I'd like to believe. <laughs> I personally think there is a gap in the market for a ballerina dancing astrophysics. <laughs> well, if that is, is the way. This, um, <laughs> there's this like dance your thesis thing that people keep sending me. and. I'm this close to doing it. 
<laughs> well, I also, so um, in my role in the education and skills group, we um, also work with a lot of um, organisations that create education resources. And I am sure this is a couple of years back and my memory is not great, but I'm sure there was a dance company that was looking to involve children with disabilities through dance and get them interested in space that way. So, you know, don't laugh it off. <laughs> so I, I've been working with um, Let's Do Engineering, it's a programme run by um, a team at Harriet Wall. And it's kind of like creating a, a bridge between scientists and artists, all different types of artists. And they kept saying to me that I should work with the dance people because I was a dancer. And I was just like, how is this going to work? Like, I don't really understand how that's going to kind of, how that's going to kind of come about. And I spoke to them and we ended up doing like a drama activity. And honestly, it was amazing. Like it was something I hadn't actually considered about like how you kind of like teach kids about like movement and imagining things and kind of like processing things, how they move. Um, it was really cool and like I remember the time I was just like I just think they're gonna this is a bit wild but okay let's see how it goes and it was really really good like I was so impressed yeah yeah definitely Matt what would you be doing if you weren't doing this are you, are you a, a, a hidden ballet dancer as well <laughs> ah, well I, I I love to dance but not really to ballet <laughs> or more four on the floor or, uh, <laughs> so um <laughs> I'd like I, I'd like to either be a, a motor racing driver but I don't think I've got the actual talent to do that or um I'd like to be a chef. Mm. I love cooking. I, yeah. I'd like, you know, I find myself using words like flavour palette and things like <laughs> this. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, as I got older, I've sort of become much more into sort of like putting different things together and thinking, actually, I can see how that would work with that. Yeah, and yeah. so, um, yeah, I have, you know, part, every so often I think to myself, maybe I'll just give it all up and go and run a, <laughs> a, a, a vegan burrito stall in the market or something. So... Um, <laughs> Fantastic. I would okay. that. <laughs> yeah. Matt is also a very good cook, I can confirm this. <laughs> we'll have to go around there for dinner. So sticking to the space careers then, there's a question from Bob, um, which I think I might take back to, to Matt or Manish. Uh, is there any hope for an inquisitive, practical, but not academic person? Is age a factor? Would anyone like to answer that? Well, I'll just yeah. say one quick thing then, which is that there's a... Uh, a website called unmannedspaceflight.org um, and it's lots of amateurs and sometimes they, they, they do lots of processing of different planetary data sets and they do new things with it they, they make little scripts and, and plugins and software they do all sorts of stuff and these are enthused a amateurs not people with strong academic backgrounds and they do the most amazing stuff and occasionally you find people like that who end up getting roles with NASA or, or ESA. There's um, one of the guys who worked on the um, visualization and the planning of the 2020 mission, um, started as sort of an amateur and then sort of got headhunted by, you know, so mm -hmm. I think the thing is, if you're, if you're doing it sort of more from an amateur or as a non-academic side, this is where social media and, and platforms on the internet really help. You can get your stuff out there and say, this is what I do, this is what I make, this, this is what I can, bring to the table and people will see it because we do actually look at some of these amateur sites you know and and check out what's going on yeah definitely and I think actually that kind of onto the bigger picture as well just with networking I, I um, had a session this morning I said that's you know really a key thing like I know obviously COVID has stopped a lot of in person but although they're coming back but, you know going out to conferences but using social media networking that way as well to you know talk about these issues if you're not in the sector there's there's lots of kind of different communities um, for it as well so yeah absolutely so another question here, which I can answer from Miss Yowd, which is, can you get into a job with space through apprenticeships? So one of the things that the UK Space Agency does is fund um, apprenticeships in the space sector. They're called SPIN, Space Placements in Industry. And we have just started to advertise some now as they're coming through um, for summer 2022. And um, there are also apprenticeships with the OU as well, I believe. Um, and then some of the bigger space companies such as Airbus, Lockheed Martin also run their own apprenticeship programs as well. So yes, definitely at the moment there for at least the ones from through the um, UK Space Agency are for university students. Um, but, you know, have a look around at, at local space companies if you're looking more for younger age work placements and things. It's always worth asking. Um, can't promise anything, but definitely have a look. Oh, I like this one. What are you most proud of during your careers? Manish, would you like to take the floor? What are you most proud of? <laughs> I'll give Matt some time because I've just seen his <laughs> open. 
What am I most proud of? Um, I think probably the most remarkable moment in my career was probably right at the beginning. I'm not sure what that says for my recent work, but when when I started my career, I started on the Cassini Huygens mission, and uh, we were at Mission Control when that first uh, image of Titan, Titan's a moon around Saturn, and it's covered in this dense fog, and no one had ever seen the surface. So we were sending a mission into the unknown, quite literally. And when that first image flickered up on the screen, you know, movie movie style um, suspense, and we saw that that landscape that no one had ever seen before, I think, I think that was a very proud moment of achieving something and seeing something that no one had ever done before. And it's all come purely from curiosity. What is there? And and that that's a really nice feeling to um uh, to to know that you've done something. Not, not for money, not for greed or fortune and glory. Uh, I wouldn't mind, but, uh, <laughs> but but really just because it's there to be done and, yeah. and we're inquisitive. Yeah, no, I love that. Yeah, thank you. Sarah, what's your most proud moment of your career? I'm going to caveat with this because I'm very, very early in my career. Um, but there's, I think, I'm, so I said I worked on some of the software, so some processing um, software that I've been working on and there's now a chunk of that code that has my name ascribed to it and this probably matters here to everybody else but seeing my name in this code that's going to be used on data returns from Mars like every time I think about that it like makes me need to like sit down and have a think about like how kind of far I've come and all these things I've learned and that like I have made however small it might be now this kind of this actual change with the way the science is going to be done on Mars and like that's pretty wild still to me every day. Yeah. That's incredible. Wow. And Matt, what about you? That's a really tough one. I, I hate mm. sort of questions like this. Um, <laughs> I think um, uh, about six or seven years ago, um, the UK Space Agency was looking for somebody to run a Mars field uh, trial. Um, in fact, I, I'm drinking out the very mug. So it's, it's called Murphy, the Mars Utah Rover Field Investigation. And they had a leader for the field side of it. They didn't have a leader for the um, command center side of things. So we were simulating a Mars rover that was in Utah, and we were going to be back in in Oxford, actually. And so I was asked to do that, and we put it all together. And I sunk my soul and my time into that. And, you know, I put so much effort into it, and it actually worked really, really well. And because of that, so many younger people in the UK planetary geology sort of group area have gone on and got jobs and fellowships and because they had this sort of big step up by being involved in this getting to see you know work as a team basically mm. and so sort of you know knowing that it wasn't me doing it all but I had sort of facilitated everyone else's success on that I think that was one you know it's one I can rem- definitely remember thinking and thinking gosh that actually worked really well so I'm very proud of that yeah so. Yeah, no, because I was trying to think of mine. I thought, obviously, I was incredibly, you know, on a personal level, proud and pleased when I got the the job at the European Space Agency. That was an incredible moment for me personally. But actually, I think my proudest moment was working in the UK Space Agency. We worked on the, our team worked on the, um, on Tim Peake's, the British astronaut on his Principia mission, uh, funding and managing all the education projects or a lot of the education projects that were going on at the time and working with Tim whilst he was um, on the space station, which was a really exciting moment as well but um you know that reached millions of school children in the UK and you know they're kind of hopefully <laughs> the long-term effects of that and getting them interested in in space and seeing that they could potentially have a career there too um definitely I think it's a proud work moment for me I'm just looking at the time oh gosh do we have time for one more question and then I need to hand over to the next panel uh, pa- panel um or do we have Ah, OK, I oh, quite like this one, actually, but I think I'll ask all of you if it, just a quick answer because I don't want to overrun. Um, but this is from Srila Duta and it was Sarah. Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? But I'm actually going to ask everyone. But Sarah, do you want to start off? Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Or Mars um, exploration, maybe <laughs> make, bring that back yeah. in. <laughs> um, so hopefully 10 years from now, we're kind of getting like into the meat of the sample return mission from Mars, which is a massive global effort to return samples from Mars. So. I would like to be developing instruments or missions in that kind of space if I'm still working in science or research. Hopefully I'll be training to be an astronaut to be sent to Mars in 50 or 20 years, but 
to be reasonable, I'd like to be developing missions um, and instruments with a space agency or a space company or a university. Wow, thank you. And Manish, 10 years from now. Ideally, Desert Island, Sandy Beach, <laughs> just reaping the rewards of a, the of fame a life, and glory. <laughs> life scientific. <laughs> in reality, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're designing instruments and missions to go to Mars in the 2030s. So we, we actually, it's an interesting question because we work in a 10 year uh, forward look anyway. So we're always looking 10 years. So we have missions going to Mars where we're going to measure the weather on Mars and, uh, and also Venus. That's the other big one that we're heading for. So plunging into the depths of Venus uh, in the next 10 years. Hopefully. Yeah. Oh, exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing Ma that. Manish <laughs> stole my answer, which was <laughs> there's an island drinking, I don't know, something nice and cold. Um, uh, yeah, I think for me, I'm hoping to be much more involved uh, post ExoMars Rosalind Franklin um, in the Venus missions because that's what I did my PhD on. Um, and then I moved straight to Mars and I, you know, there's a lot of unfinished business to do there. So when I, when I did my PhD, it was right at the tail end of the Magellan missions time. So lots of the big science questions that Magellan could have solved had been sort of solved. And so we were using sort of the leftover bits you know of their data set that hadn't really been looked at it'd be lovely it's always nice to be in on the ground floor to see to get the new set of data you know to see you know things that no one else has seen before so yes yeah. so yeah, so i hope hopefully hopefully there Fab. great thank you and hopefully 10 years from now some of the people on this call right now will be working in these areas how about that so and it, actually that's the last question i can see on the chat is from henrique um, which was asking about a site where there's jobs um uh, i i think he means jobs in the in the space sector so i can say that um space careers uk is a good place to start especially for young um recently recent graduates but young career professionals um but yeah just have a have a look there and for the younger ones amongst you obviously this um whole day is from stem learning um and there are loads and loads of education and career resources there so um take a look there but i want to thank my wonderful panel um for for talking and, and sharing your stories and your insights and advice um and, and to careers 